star-spangled fascists fighting fascism in the United States. Welcome to our third panel of the day. I'm Mark Dollinger. I teach in the Department of Jewish Studies at San Francisco State University. And we are honored to welcome three of the leading scholars in the field for today's conversation. To my immediate left, Professor Jeff Garak, who holds the Libby M. Klaperman Professorship of Jewish History at Yeshiva University. He is author of 24 books, too many best book awards to enumerate here. And this is a very serious topic at a very serious week. So I want to offer um, a little bit of humanity here and uh, let you know that Prof Professor Garak has, has finished the New York City Marathon 12 times. To his left, Professor Stephen Ross holds the Dean's Professorship of History at the University of Southern California, where he directs the Kasdan Institute for the Study of the Jewish Role in American Life. He is author of four books. The one that we are most interested in today is his most recent book, Hitler in Los Angeles, How Jews Foiled Plots Against Hollywood and America. And our fun fact for you, Professor Ross, he was a commentator on the re-release of the DVD, Planet of the Apes, which I did not know. <laughs> Professor Anna Dunsing, postdoctoral fellow at the Carter G. Whitson Institute at the University of Virginia, um, who is a specialist in African-American history, black radicalism, transnational social movements, and the evolving global politics of white supremacy in 20th century United States. Her first book, um, which won Yale University's best dissertation award in its earlier incarnation, Fascism is Already Here, Civil Rights and the Making of a Black Anti-Fascist Tradition, follows black activists, artists, intellectuals, and their multicultural coalitions from the 1930s to the 1970s, uh, which has already won numerous awards. And our, our fun fact, uh, Professor, uh, raised in the U.S. Virgin Islands and has worked at the Guggenheim, the Met, the Henry Street Settlement, and also here at the Lower East Side Tenement Museum. It's great to have you here. Uh, Jeff, we'll start with you. To get us started, give us an overview of American Jewish responses to fascism to sort of set us up for today's conversation. Well, I'm not going to give you an overview of the entire country. I'm going to focus upon my favorite city, New York City, which I've written about most of my career. One might think that given the fact that New York City was the largest Jewish community uh, in the country, and although Washington, D.C. was a national center, uh, New York was a media center, and all the Jewish defense organizations, almost all the Jewish defense organizations uh, in this country were centered in New York, that New York Jews would have an unqualified, robust response to the problems of fascism. But as you'll see in a few moments, and I'll just offer three vignettes about the difficulties, there's a diversity of opinion from various quarters as to what to do, how to do it, and if indeed anything should be done. And the topic sentence is, it all has a lot to do with how you see yourself as a New York Jew or an American Jew in terms of what you're doing will play on what we call the American street. And there's ambivalence and there's also activism, a variety of sorts. And I'm gonna start with an unconventional group that was very active physically in response to fascism and that's some organized crime figures who are part of Mur Murder Incorporated. Bugsy Siegel. Meyer Lansky are part of a group that fought very strongly against uh, German-American Bund people in the streets of Yorkville, in the streets of Ridgewood, Queens, and elsewhere. And they, they were encouraged by a Jewish judge named Nathan Perlman who told them you can fight in the streets but don't kill anybody beat people up, but don't kill it. But the important point here is that the approbation for their activities was directed by none other than Stephen S. Wise, the head of the American Jewish Congress. So why would Stephen S. Wise get involved with these criminal elements? 
By the way, they were part of it because they were proud Jews, but also criminals. And you might know that in the 1970s, Meyer Lansky asked for citizenship in the state of Israel as a returning Jew, and Golda Meir turned him down. And he said at that point, when no one else would fight, we fought, and now I can't be a citizen of the, the state of Israel. Why would Stephen S. Wise support this type of violent activism? So I want to contextualize this in a variety of ways. Um, for Stephen Wise, the German-American Bund, they were loud, they were obnoxious, and they were un-American. You may know that World War, after World War I, German-Americans were in poor favor within America. So to fight against them is not a problem in terms of how the American street would visualize what these Jews uh, are doing. I, I should note here that in fighting against the Bund, I want to mention the name of a plumber named Isidore Goodman from Williamsburg, who jumped on the stage in 1939 and, and pulled off Fritz Kuhn's mic as part of his attack against the Bund in the great Madison Square Garden, and then he was beaten up by, by uh, Bund activities. My point here is that if you feel that what you're doing has the approbation of Americans, then you're willing to be vital in terms of response, even, even go so far as have an alliance with, with a criminal uh, element. By the way, um, the Bund was a problem for what I'll call good German-Americans in the 1930s. You probably know that the senior senator from the state of New York was Robert F. Wagner Sr. He was of German heritage and a great supporter of Jewish causes. In fact, he was the architect of a bill that was never passed by the United States Congress called the Wagner-Rogers Act to bring in 10,000 refugee children. Now, you want to be cynical and say, okay, it, for a senator from the state of New York to support Jews is no big deal. But it is a big deal, and he was very troubled by these German-Americans who, by the way, were refugees who didn't want to live under Weimar, who came here in the 1920s. That's vignette number one of strong activism. Vignette number two, we go to a different place in Manhattan, to 138th Street and Amsterdam Avenue, City College of New York, a hotbed of radical activity. Uh, it was called the Hater on the Hill, very socialist. Many of the students were socialists, although they also had a very robust ROTC cadre, to say the least. Many of these students on the left opposed what they called war and fascism. And they didn't want to get involved in an upcoming war, a capitalist war. And yet, when Kristallnacht takes place in 1938, there's a turn. There's an important moment in time where they have to decide whether they are total universalists or whether they have Jewish content in their lives. And if you look at the records of City College, you start to, to see some of these people getting involved in Jewish causes because they realize their own ethnicity as opposed to being universalists. And my third vignette, I don't want to dominate this discussion, the third vignette is a remarkable story of the reaction of the Jewish community to Robert Edward Edmondson. Robert Edward Edmondson was a, a pamphleteer, a writer who was a virulent anti-Semite. He's not a refugee, he's not obnoxious, but he's very powerful. He does pamphlets talk based upon the protocols of the elders of Zion. What's the reaction of the Jewish community of New York to Edmondson? To begin with, the mayor of the city of New York, Biro LaGuardia, who has strong Jewish roots in many respects, sues him as a libelous because he referred to uh, LaGuardia as also being a Jew. When, when Edmondson is uh, brought to trial initially, the Jewish organizations support LaGuardia in going after Edmondson. However, as the trial proceeds, and I want to get these organizations right, five organizations, the American Civil Liberties Union, the American Committee on Religious Rights and Minorities, the Human Rights Committee of the National Council of Jewish Women, 
the American Jewish Congress, and the American Jewish Community Committee. And Wise was a member of several of these organizations. Four of these five organizations are Jewish, perhaps also ACLU in terms of its constituency. All of them send amicus curiae briefs to the court supporting Edmondson's defense because they fear, and I'll quote from one of the articles about it, it is doubtful if a conviction will be in the public interest. Efforts would be made to have it appear the defendant was a, defendant was a martyr to the cause of civil rights. The case ended up being dismissed. For them, the issue of civil rights was so important, and they worried about the status of Jews in America, they let Robert Edmondson off, and again, the case was dismissed. Three different visions of what should be done, and there are many more, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Um, Steve, we're going to get to espionage now. Uh, your work has focused on espionage, which gets really fascinating really quickly. Um, how has espionage developed, and how did it play out in the fight against fascism? So let me start with a larger context for resistance, and that is <clears throat> I grew up 12 miles from here in Queens, near Bayside. My uh, father was a survivor of Dachau, my mother a survivor of Auschwitz. And I grew up with the question of why didn't Jews do more to stop this? both in America and in Europe. And it was only when I began researching this book that I realized, my God, Jews in fact were doing a lot. We just don't know it because they were running spy operations that they didn't want the Goyim to know about. And Hitler comes to power, so why does that start? Hitler comes to power in January 1933. And immediately Jewish groups respond to it. Jews did respond. They just had a deeply divided strategy. But a deeply divided strategy is not the same as no strategy. You had basically Stephen Wise in the American Jewish Congress that wanted to get in Hitler's face, pressure him, have an international boycott, uh, and get him to back down. The American Jewish Committee, run by Judge Proskauer then, said no. If you get in his face, he's going to double down and make it worse for the Jews. We need to work with. Uh, religious leaders in Germany behind the scenes. So this debate goes on from January through the summer. There is no unity on how we respond. And finally, in Los Angeles, in late July 1933, the Friends of New Germany, who would later become the German-American Bund, hold their first open meeting in the city. And at the end of the meeting, they declare that they are going to save America from its two greatest threats, communists, and Jews. And at the end of that meeting, they sign up several hundred people. Well, the next day on the front page of the LA newspapers are a shot of five stormtroopers with giving the Hitler salute and a big story about what was going on. Well, it was read by a man named Leon Lewis, who had been the founding executive secretary of the Anti-Defamation League in 1913. And Lewis had to move to LA around 1930 for health reasons, but remained the ADL's representative to Southern California, and he also was the ADL's representative to the motion picture industry, a job he had had since 1915. And he is so upset that no one is doing anything that he marches from his downtown office one mile south to uh, Patriotic Hall, which had been built in 1926 by the LA Board of Supervisors for all patriotic groups. And amongst the groups there were the um, uh, uh, there were Jewish war disabled American veterans were there. And he goes and he recruits three men and two of their wives who agree to go undercover and spy on every Nazi and fascist group in the city and send him regular reports. And Lewis starts a one-man spy operation that runs from August 1st, 1933, to the end of World War II. And Lewis was, of course, at times troubled by what the lovely Marjorie Taylor Greene, in her ignorance, referred to as the Jewish gazpacho, <laughs> which was, in fact, a term coined in the 1950s by the uh, Sean Hannity of their day, Westbrook Pegler, who talked about the Jewish Gestapo. 
and about Jews spying on Christians. Well, in Hitler in LA, I tell the story of how they run this spy operation. And by the way, all the spies, other than his initial, some of the initial, no, all the spies except for one are Christian. And what I find interesting about this story is they are work, they are not working for the Jews. They know Leon Lewis is Jewish. They know he is part of the Anti-Defamation League, but they feel he's working for America. Because what they argue is in America, when one native group starts talking hate and calling for death and violence against another American group, simply because their race, their religion, their ethnicity, it is the obligation of every citizen in this country to stand up and stop it. And the other thing which I have, there is, there are books here to be written on this. Lewis starts meeting with people with ADL chapters in the Midwest. And there are all these spy operations that are going on in the Midwest. And here in New York, by 1940, the ADL begins running a spy operation here. The American Jewish Committee are running a spy operation. And the most radical of all is a group called the Non-Sectarian Anti-Nazi League, who are sending in agent provocateurs, not just as Lillian Lewis did. Most, many of his men rose to uh, head up some of these Nazi groups and fascist groups, or not head, but in positions of leadership. Uh, one of his chief spies, uh, Hans Schmidt, um, uh, John Schmidt, rather, his wife becomes the head of the German-American Bund's Women's Committee. And because she is fluent in German and English, they ask her to go up to their secret room and translate all the documents going from Germany and going to Germany. And of course, every translation is then sent to Leon Lewis. And what I would say is Jews were never protected by civil authorities, the police, the sheriff, Leon Lewis went to the police chief, went to the sheriff with admissible, he's a lawyer, he went with admissible evidence, and when he went to see the police chief, he threw him out saying, you don't get it. The real problem in LA and the real danger are all those Jews in Boyle Heights who are commies. They're the ones we're worried about, not the Nazis. And when I get asked at various talks, how do you justify, how do you justify this spying by one small group? Isn't this vigilantism? And my response, including the head of my temple in LA, isn't it vigilantism? My response is, if you look at uh, social contract theory, why do states get formed? Whether you're Locke, Hobbes, Rousseau, the fundamental obligation of a state to be a legitimate state is to protect the lives of its citizens. When a state no longer protects the lives of its citizen, it is up to the citizens to protect their own lives. And this is what Jewish resistance was based on. No one wanted to go out with a vigilante kind of operation. No one wanted to do these spy things. But if no authority, including the man I hate the most, and I can't believe Beverly Gage wrote such a nice book about him, J, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, major anti-Semite. He would not protect any Jew in America until he absolutely had to, not until there were explosions in uh, 1941 in New Jersey and Pennsylvania when uh, Nazis blew up munitions factories. So that, that is a kind of big picture of spying in America. Thank you. And I know as all of your questions are percola percolating in your brains, now would be a good time if you haven't already to start writing them down because we'll be picking them up in a few minutes. If you're watching from home, please put your questions in the chat. Uh, we have folks here who will be writing them down so we'll be able to address them as well. Um, Anna, it seems as if uh, our conversation has really been leading right to uh, your particular uh, field of research, um, and that is that the fight against fascism demands alliances and allyship between and among different groups. Your work tells us about these efforts, especially in the African-American community. How do you understand the role and import of these sorts of joint efforts? So. Um... I'm going to pull us back to the East Coast, um, and I really think it is worth, um, you know, in the spirit of pulling up these histories, recovering these histories, um, the extent to which we can celebrate New York as an anti-fascist city. Um, I mean, I think it's important to name how close we are to it, how much of um, these rallies, these demonstrations happened at Union Square, um, just two blocks away in 1923. 
on 14th Street uh, opened both the headquarters of the Italian fascist and anti-fascist groups um, right across the street from each other, right? So that when we're reaching for these histories, I think we can take comfort in knowing how close um, it all is and how the legacies we can build on are, are in our own backyards. So I think um, looking at sort of grassroots anti-fascist efforts in the United States um, and in New York and looking at how everyday people sort of found a place for themselves in anti-fascist struggle, I think that you really see three things really quickly. One, um, what people talked about when they talked about fascism and anti-fascism was capacious and flexible. Um, I think there's an, an importance to pursuing um, helpful working terminology, but I also think at a certain point that needs to fall away because it's sort of always been these, um, these evolving um, entities, right, in the same way that political language is ungovernable in, in, the, in the minds of everyday people. Um, <sighs> The second conclusion you can see is that um, the toggling between local and, and global was constant, um, and it was really important for people to understand the struggles in their cities, um, and <clears throat> excuse me, in their communities to be bound up with global struggles and a global struggle against fascism. And then I think the third thing is that anti-fascism is fundamentally a politics of solidarity, right? That's, that's, that's it. Um, and the idea is that anti-fascism allows people to, to yoke their own, um, their struggles to, to, to other ones. So I think by way of an anecdote to tie all this together, um, in 1934, up at City College, uh, there was a large anti-fascist demonstration. Um, it was led by a young Jewish radical from the Bronx named Wilfred Mendelssohn. He was the son of two Eastern European Jewish immigrants who met in night school. Um, and Mendelssohn organized this rally with a few other students because the uh, president of City College had recently invited and hosted a delegation of Italian students sent by Mussolini to sort of represent um, young Italian fascist um, minds. And so, at this rally at City College, they burned an effigy to Mussolini and to the president of City College, actually. Um, so then what does Mendelssohn do next? So in 1935 then, there he is again at a mass rally at City College um, of students organizing on the day that Italy invaded Ethiopia. And a really important part of this 1930s moment is the extent to which the, the fascist in invasion of Ethiopia um, was, was, a, was a significant turning point and, and rallying point moment um, for, for, for black Americans in particular because it symbolized right, um, the racial and imperial um, engines of fascism, right? That at that point, Ethiopia and Haiti were the two, uh, only two free black nations on earth, right? And, and, and mind you, they're also then thinking that the United States has just wrapped at that point a, what, 15 years long occupation of Haiti, right? So these connections are sort of starting to, to flow pretty readily. Um, so then Mendelssohn, right, that's a rallying point for him as well. Then the next year, there's another even larger anti-fascist demonstration at City College. Um, it's unclear whether or not Mendelssohn was there. Um, historians speculate he was, but at this point he has dropped out of City College and he's organizing full time for the Young Communist League. But in 1936, they burn an even bigger set of effigies, and this time it's Mussolini, Hitler, and Franco, right? So you're seeing right, sort of even how they're symbolizing what is fascist has sort of grown. Um, and, and then, right, where, where do we find Mendelssohn next? In 1938, he's in one of the last waves of young people um, who go to Spain, and he volunteers with the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, and, um, and he dies there. And so, right, you can see just in one individual's life, the way all these struggles are yoked together, I think really similarly, um, another Abraham Lincoln Brigade veteran, James Yates, um, he called his memoir from Mississippi to Madrid. And he understood that, you know, growing up um, very poor and black in Mississippi was was what imbued him with his initial anti-fascist politics, um, and that he could, and he came back to the United States, um, was blacklisted for having fought, um, 
and then was the longtime head of the Greenwich Village chapter of the NAACP. Right, again, so I, I, I'll stop there for now, but I think you can just sort of start to see all these seamless connections and the way everyday people um, pouring into the streets at these rallies had ample grounds to sort of just see it all happening in real time. Thank you, what a great book title. Wow, uh, Mississippi to Madrid. Uh, I, I wanna um, push a point here with all three of you, the years of scholarship and expertise that you've each done in your respective fields of anti-fascism. Uh, what's your estimation of how successful they were and they being whomever it was uh, that you studied. Well, <clears throat> I'd like to comment on your fine presentation about what's going on at City College. To be sure, you have a strong coterie of people who in fact, in some cases, drop out of City College to go out and fight the good fight, whether it's down south with the Scottsboro Boys or going to Spain, et cetera. My take on City College is twofold. You have that core group of people. I said to some people at lunch, if I asked you, which college in America had the largest ROTC cadre prior to World War II. Believe it or not, it's a school that's 80% Jewish. It's called City College of New York. So you have those who are deeply committed to the cause, and my presentation said that they begin to turn a little bit in terms of their Jewishness as we approach 1939. But I'm also interested in the rank and file of Jews who go to City College who sadly are apathetic, and if you think that resonates with contemporary times today, I, I would agree with you. That's very much part of our story. Apathetic Jews who are uh, pursuing their lives and not getting involved in the causes of the time. Um, uh, mention was made of the non-sectarian league, very important league in terms of the boycott of German goods. Well, I want to read to you a statement made in the Menorah Journal, an intellectual journal, by a writer named Louis Minsky, commenting on the fact that the World, the World Telegram newspaper in New York is complaining that there are too many Jewish activities in our city, this great city, Jewish city of New York. Uh, and he, this Louis Minsky writes, the policy of fighting anti-Semitism by public agitation, parades, mass meetings, oratorical inventive, persist in mobilizing boycotts without regard to the consequences serve no real purpose. What was ultimately needed is the help of sincere Christians and there are not enough of them around in New York City. So uh, when we talk about this boycott, yes, there's a the boycott of German goods, the strong commitment on the part of some people, but also fear that being too overt in their activities might rebound against us as Jews. That's the mindset, I believe, of 1930 Jews in, uh, in New York and elsewhere. And as far as spying is concerned, thank God for these spies and that the American Jewish Committee, the American Jewish Congress, the Non-Sectarian League supported that, but it's surreptitious. It's not open, it's not in the streets. That dynamic didn't really obtain that strongly among Jews in the largest Jewish city in America also known as New York. Thank you. So Steve, so you took some heat from your synagogue leadership over this espionage campaign in LA. Were they at least successful in your mind? Oh, uh, they were incredibly successful because for Hitler, uh, Los Angeles, not New York, was the most important city in America. And it was the most important city in America for two reasons. It had the world's leading propaganda machine called Hollywood and they were determined to make sure that there would be no anti-Nazi, anti-Hitler movies. But more importantly, and there's where the spies come in, New York City uh, was, the port of New York City was very closely guarded because Fiorello LaGuardia, if I'm not mistaken, his mother is Jewish and his father's Protestant. He was a rabid anti-Nazi, and I believe he made a deal with the, uh, basically the mob, with the longshoremen, the Teamsters, do whatever you want on the docks, we'll turn a blind eye, but make sure no Nazi propaganda troops, anything comes through. LA was an open port. And my spies, I have all these records of the head of the Bund there going down, getting money, getting secret orders, and spies. Nazi spies were being sent in through LA. They were going to the Midwest, they were going down to Mexico City. And Leon Lewis's spies were tracking all of this. The only government official to listen to him was the head of Navy espionage on the uh, West Coast, uh, Zach, uh, 
Zacharias, Colonel Zacharias, who was a Jew, Elias Zacharias, one of the few Jewish graduates of the Naval Academy. He listened to him. He, in fact, shut down a uh, silver shirt Nazi operation in the military base in San Diego. And the real truth is LA was the largest producer of aircraft in America. And his spies uncovered numerous plots to blow up, well, not to blow up, to uh, make sure that those airplanes did not fly. He had spies in the German restaurant that was near Lockheed. And one of the waitresses there overheard the men speaking in German, talking about we're going to make sure the ball bearings are not in there. We're going to make sure that these plans will never get off the ground. Leon Lewis would then contact every one of the airport's uh, aircraft manufacturer security division, and they managed to capture those people. And there was not a single, not one episode of sabotage on the entire West Coast while Leon Lewis was running his operation. More to the point, come uh, Pearl Harbor. The day after Pearl Harbor on December 8th, there is a memo sent by the Justice Department to LA with the names of something like 90 of the most dangerous Nazis and fascists in the city. And it's amazing, if you go on the FBI website, they look, um, they look incredible because within 24 hours they round up most of the Nazis and fascists. And I said to myself, given what I know, how did they know who these people were? Because when I asked the head of the Bund and the number two Nazi in America is a man named Hermann Schwinn in LA, I got the, his Freedom of Information Act FBI file. The file starts in January 1942. So wait a minute. If it starts in 42, and the FBI are rounding up all these guys in December 41, how did they know? And the answer is starting in September 1st, 1939, and until the war, Leon Lewis and his associate spymaster Joe Roos put together a several hundred page volume listing every Nazi and fascist in LA, and then compiling a list of three categories, highly dangerous, dangerous, keep under surveillance. Well, when I looked at the FBI report, they talked about categories A, B, and C. And, that, and what did I see? I went back to the National Archives, because my gut told me this is like plagiarism. And sure enough, I found the memo Leon Lewis sent them. They copied Leon Lewis's memo. Every name there was a name he sent them in the same categories of highly dangerous, dangerous, under surveillance. And that's how they wound up knowing who was dangerous in the city, because they had no information other than what the Jews supplied them with. Thank you. Uh, Anna, as challenging as it is to organize even within the Jewish community, you can imagine what it is to create allyships across uh, different lines. How successful do you think um, those efforts were? So, I mean, I'm sure I share with um, my fellow panelists and, and everyone here today that it can be pretty easy to feel bleak about a lot of this stuff, right? And to say, so what, you know, the, the right, you know, just does keep winning and winning um, at so many levels. And, you know, the, my research, you know, you like steeped in, in the 1930s, you can see, right, oh, this, this didn't start, this wasn't, this didn't start with the Tea Party, this didn't start with Rush Limbaugh, right? The, these are patterns and traditions that you, you see in the 30s in the shifting political scene in the United States. That said, I, I think there are ample success stories. So I think we're, at, we're and ag again, I've, I, a lot of it is looking local, um, looking to your own communities, but I think where are their successes? Um, you know, if, if I, I'm pro-spying in this, in this way, right, that the, the, the investigative prowess of these volunteers often, right, is, is unmatched. And I think I would put that in a larger pattern of, of campaigns about um, what I think today we, is often referred to as deplatforming um, and denying fascists and far right organizers um, that um, flame of, of attention, right? That spark. Um, and there's so many examples of that. Again, um, very local. You know, in 1960, there was a broad coalition of um, civil rights and labor organizers who successfully kept George Lincoln Rockwell, the American Nazi party head, from rallying on the 4th of July at Union Square, right? So deep, the, this deep tradition of deplatforming. And I think the investigation work is, is, is crucial. And again, you always see you know, a great example. So I write about the anti-Nazi League a bit as well. Um, 
and I, I write about one campaign they did actually in 1946-47 to infiltrate a, um, it's weird to call them a neo-Nazi movement, but a, a fascist formation in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, successfully, they got you know their leaders put on trial eventually with the evidence they gained, but I read the head of the anti-Nazi League's FBI file and who is who is Hoover mad at? Him, right? Who's who does he he see as the threat? Him, not the not the Colombians, which was the name of the the fascist group in in Atlanta. Um, so I think sort of militant deplatforming in the streets, as well as the research and the investigative work, countless successes. And I think also I was sort of reflecting, knowing Steve and I have worked in in similar archives. These archives were also built up by anti-fascist activists, right? So the very fact that we can we can recover and share these stories is on the basis of, you know, both at Columbia University and Brown, there are these massive collections of right-wing material, and those were collected by activists who said we need to record this hateful literature. We need to send for these pamphlets, like hundreds of boxes of material, right? So I think again. The investigative work it, it happens on multiple fronts, but one of them is in, even in creating the very archives that that allow us to be here. Um, and then I think there's a more ineffable kind of success, um, which is how the you know anti-fascism in the 30s, I especially think for Black Americans, was a kind of popular vernacular. You read Black newspapers in the 30s, and it's sort of suffused into everything. Um, and I think the most famous, the culmination of all of this, is the Double V campaign, which was a campaign started by the Pittsburgh Courier, which was one of the larger Black newspapers, thinking about um, framing World War II, framing Black military service in particular as a, a fight for democracy, both abroad and at home, and, and a lot of people pushed it further and said, no, I'm, I'm fighting fascism, both abroad and at home. Um, but, but one of the sort of initial questions that sparked my whole project was, you know, reading any black newspaper in the 30s and 40s and the accessibility um, and richness of this sort of everyday anti-fascist politics was just so saturated that I thought, like, what, where does this go after 1945? And the answer is it's, it's, it's one of the um, forces that leads to the civil rights movement, right? Which we should push past thinking, sort of begins tidily in 1954 and ends in 1965. Which, right, who's marching in those streets? Black World War II veterans, right? Who were electrified by an anti-fascist politics. Um, and I think, right, the, the incredibly famous, you know, um, alliance between black and Jewish activists in the 50s and 60s, I mean, I'm, the very basis of my work is to follow them backward. And what were they doing in the 30s? They were at anti-fascist demonstrations. Yeah, so let me, let me if, I, if I can real quick, I wanna to jump to the last question then we'll get to you if we have a moment. Um, since we're at Public Symposium here at the Center for Jewish History, uh, as historians, it's our job to recover the past for its own sake. And now I'm gonna say, since we've been talking about Marjor Marjorie Taylor Greene and the Tea Party movement, uh, applicability for each of your historical research in the contemporary moment. And, Jeff, I'll give you a first shot here. Well, first I want to comment about the African American community. Within the Harlem community in the 1930s, there was Sufi Abdul Hamid, who was a black nationalist. You could say he's a forerunner of Louis Farrakhan, who was very pro Hitler in his rhetoric. And he's pilloried by the Amsterdam News and the New York Age, two very important black newspapers who say he doesn't re represent us. And the New York Age went further and said, are you aware of the fact that leftist students from City College, that university on the hill, are coming down to Harlem on an ongoing basis, and they're helping in the, in the free lunch program for African-American predominant students uh, at, at that time period? So you have that mixture of activities. I, I think what I'm trying to say about contemporary times based upon the 1930s is the question of people, activists, who want to go out of their way to push an agenda the, the appropriate way, and people who are living prosaic lives and don't do anything, let the world pass them, so long as they are living their own partic particular lives. So that, that's one of the things, that's one of the takeaways I get from my research from, from that, uh, that time period. 
Thank you. And just note, we are now collecting your questions. So if you have those questions, just look and folks will pick it up and bring it, bring it to here. Uh, Steve, uh, any applicability? Yeah, I, I believe it was in the 1930s, and maybe my friend Tom Dougherty here can tell me who it was that said it, that when fascism comes to America, it's going to be star-spangled fascism. Do you remember who said it, Tom? Anyway, it's what we have today. Star-spangled fascism. These are people, this is sort of what my follow-up book I'm doing now to Hitler in L.A. that I'm almost done with is called The Secret War Against Hate. American resistance to white supremacy up to 1945. And it's the story the spy operations never stop. In fact, the records, the spy records of the American Jewish Committee are here in the archives. The ADL is spying, and the Anti-Nazi League are spying. And those spy operations, for some of them, go to 1980. And some of that spying is still going on to this very day. And I would say, you know, this, the spying is important to find out what's going on, and I still believe it is. I still believe when the state does not protect you, it is your right to protect yourself. Now, I'm not saying go out and kill anyone, harm anyone, but if you're gonna spy, you're gonna spy. And, but the more important thing is what Anne is talking about, that the applicability for today is coalitions, that you have to get as many coalitions, multi-racial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, who agree on one thing, in America, it is not American to hate another American. You simply can't do that. And when my students ask me, we were talking about this at lunch, when my students ask me, what can we do? What can we do now? I tell them, well, two things. One, the easiest is take one friend at election who wasn't planning to vote and insist they drag him to the polls. And the second thing I said, which is putting yourself in a little more danger. And you have to decide if you want to do it. But if you hear somebody talking hate speech near you, simply turn to them calmly and say, in America, we don't talk like that. Americans don't talk hate against other Americans. You are an un-American if you are doing this. Anna. So I think, I think coalitions is, is key. That's the real. Um, yeah, if you leave with anything today, that, that would be it. But I do think in particular um, a sense of how in, you know, this, this is a country of profound contradictions. And I think to, to understand um, that, that there is a version of democracy that has an anti-fascist politics within it. Um, I think, you know, looking at black Jewish coalitions and organizing in the 1930s, their anti-fascism was about expanding, um, you know, what, what one journalist called real and living democracy in the United States, right? So that the, the struggle um, should necessarily be about expanding who um, can live a good life in this country. Um, but I think interrogating some sort of, you know, darker, bloodier foundations of the United States is to really understand um, a sort of deep tradition of, of, of reaction um, and white supremacy and to understand the extent to which there are um, deep cultures of anti-black racism, anti-Semitism, and I think also especially after 1945, anti-communism all bound up together and all informing and, and fueling one another. Um, especially, a lot of my research, obviously, I am looking at just the ways that, that anti-Semitism and anti-blackness um, are just so tangled up. Um, but I think, um, you know, something I reflect on a lot, I live in Charlottesville, Virginia, and a lot of the traditions, you know, Steve researches were evident on the ground in terms of the act activist responses to the Unite the Right rally, right, the extent to which institutions um, whether it was the university, whether it was the um, elected officials, whether it was the police, all of them failed to act, but the activists did. And the extent to which they were, um, you know, on the, the insidious blogs gathering information about the groups who would be there, the extent to which they were um, informed in ways that just um, just astounding to me, remarkable, right? That's an, I think that's a, a great example of where you can see these traditions alive today. And, and something I, I sort of, took, I guess, to, to wrap this up on a, on a positive note, you know, um, 
so, I, so in addition to, to just seeing the extent to which activists were prepared in many respects on the ground in, in Charlottesville, what was also something I was struck by as, as in bearing witness to what happened there was just how there was a politics of care. Um, it wasn't just a sort of militant, let's deplatform this fascist coalition, but there was so much free food and volunteer medics and I got handed so many bottles of water, right? So I think another tradition is not just sort of anti-fascism is a productive politics. It's not just reacting to fascism, it's also building a, a better world, right? Um, and so I think that's, that's a legacy to hold on to too, that it's not just, inten it is intention with fascism, but it also is about um, caring for one another in, in, in a myriad of ways. I just want to say one last thing before we take the sure. questions. I may have come across as being very negative about the experience of American Jews to the 1930s, which was my intention. I also want to say that in 1930s, in many instances, Jews stood alone in their concerns. Uh, things are difficult today in the 21st century, but as my colleagues have indicated, Jews are not standing alone, and the need for coalitions has always existed but the coalitions did not exist as strongly back then as they do now. Uh, I just finished a book about uh, a Jewish sports figure and the 1936 boycott movement uh, where Jews stood alone with the exception of one person, Jeremiah T. Mahoney, after whom the gymnasium at City College is named today. The officials who wanted the games to go forward in America they were Nazis in many instances, and very few people supported the Jewish cause. So the optimistic side of me is this, the 21st century is not 1930s America, and I think we should take cognizance of that as well. Thank you. Right. Thank you. We have um, so many excellent questions. Um, rather than group them into a common theme, I'm actually going to throw three or four at you um, from the same historical period. Feel free to answer whichever one uh, you'd like to answer. Um, one is a, a, a question framed in the negative, which is, why haven't we spoken about Henry Ford and Dorothy Thompson, um, if you'd like to take that up? Uh, another one um, is framed as a court case, but I think we'll understand it says Stephen Wise apologist versus Peter Bergson. Uh, I think that's probably getting at the two different uh, strategies. And in the 1940s, did blacks understand um, how Germans' genocidal policies would affect them and understand that that brought them to common cause with Jews? And Anna, we can start with you if you have any, any of those you want to jump in. Yeah, so I mean, I think, uh, I mean, maybe Henry Ford hasn't come up because it's sort of like, apparently what the only American that Adolf Hitler personally admired. Um, one, so of, one of two. One of two is... Charles Lindbergh. Oh, yes, yeah. Bread and butter. Um, so, but I guess to the last question, I'll address that um, and then cede to my colleagues. Um, yeah, and I would say not, not by the 1940s, by uh, 1922, right, to watch even how the black press covers Mussolini's rise. Um, it's... It's, it's remarkable how prescient they are um, and, are and are already talking about um, the way this fascist movement um, is akin to the Klan, right? Or similarly, right, in 1932, I was so struck when I saw this in the, in the newspaper, um, re reporting on the recent election in Germany, right, where the Nazis are coming closer and closer to, to, to power, um, the black press described Hitler as the Vardaman of Europe in reference to James K. Vardaman, the virulent anti-Semitic white supremacist governor and senator of Mississippi, um, right? So again, I think it's also important to say this sort of, this, these, these politics of analogy in particular and comparison, they flowed in both directions, right? That, that Vardaman was, um, could evoke Right, whatever Hitler signified, um, and then you know, I think similarly, uh, the other kind of direct example would be um, uh, the black radical at, at the time, communist organizer George Padmore. He's working for um, the Communist International in Hamburg in early 1933, and he's writing in radical literature, but also this then gets into the black press. He's he's talking about. Um, how completely 
um, the, the black world writ large should be should have their eye on on Germany um, and writing again I think well before you see it elsewhere the um, the centering racial anti-semitism in Nazi ideology and, and naming it and talking about how racial anti-semitism is then bound up with an anti-black politics right and so he's he's writing that in early 1933 he's deported by the new Nazi government um, soon after. Um, and then the last example, you know, um, the great American intellectual W.E.B. Du Bois, he, he spent six months in Nazi Germany in 1936. Um, and when he comes home again, what he's, what he's writing, he, he, he says, something is happening here and something is happening to German Jews and we need to be vigilant. We need to have our eye on this because it, it, it it means something for them and it'll mean something for us. So I'd say from the very beginning, um, the answer is yes. And the 1940s is a kind of crescendo rather than the, the beginning of it. Thank, thank you, Jeff, and then we'll go to Steve. Uh, a few words about Henry Ford. His, his moment of anti-Semitism is really the 1920s where he publishes the Protocols of the Elders of Zion with a commentary applying the both teachings of the protocols of the American experience in the 1920s. By the end of the 20s, he's pretty much silenced for a variety of reasons, and his anti-Semitism goes underground, except for that precious moment where he's honored by the Nazis as a leading Aryan in the United States. In the 21st century, I think the CEO of Ford Motor Company is a Jew. So a, a, a bit of a moment of satisfaction on that, on that score. As far as Weisenbergson is concerned, oh my goodness, so much can be said and so much is written about that relationship. Uh, but that's from the 1940s, where the issue is not refugees, it's the question of rescue. But if I can connect that to my basic theme about how it plays on the American street, Stephen Wise was very concerned with how it played in Washington on the American street, and Peter Bergson, Hillel Cook, who's a Palestinian, in other words, Palestine before 1948, who comes to America, he is not nearly as concerned about the situation for American Jews. He's devoted to activism, stemming from the fact that in some respects, he's not an American. So I think in looking at what American Jews do, how does it play with their fellow neighbors? Thank you, Steve. Yeah, by the, I think Jeff's right. By the 1930s, it isn't Henry Ford we need to worry about. The person we need to worry about then and now is Charles Lindbergh and someone like him, because Lindbergh was um, in the tradition of the British polite anti-Semites, uh, where he was an anti-Semite, and if you read his speeches, particularly his famous Iowa speech, he says, you know, basically, I'm nothing against the Jews, but Americans should not follow the policies dictated by one small minority group in our country. There's a biography of him written by A. Scott Berg. And I met Scott after his, he wrote that. And I said to him, uh, your biography says Lindbergh wasn't an anti-Semite. But I read his speeches, and they're anti-Semitic. And he said, well, he can't be an anti-Semite because he had Jewish friends. I looked at him, I said, you didn't just say that to me, did you? And he turned around and walked away. Screw him. Uh, and the other, as for Dorothy Thompson, Darth, for those of you who don't know, Dorothy Thompson was one of the most courageous journalists of the 30s, going to Nazi Germany, going into the belly of the beast, writing about it, getting arrested, and being fearless. Going into the Madison Square Garden rally, fearless. And, you know, if we had more journalists like that, you know, the right has a better, Fox has had a better group of journalists in a way that raised the cry of their ideology. We on the liberal and left side have not done as well in terms of our public facing with journalists, whether it's print journalism or media journalism. And it would be nice to see that increasing in the next uh, few years. Thank you. Um, in the very few minutes we have left, I've grouped some questions that relate to the contemporary period um, and the work you're doing. How would you categorize what's happening with patriots, and that's in quotes, such as former General Michael Flynn's Awaken America movement? 
How should we talk to individuals who are on the fence? People not crazy about Trump, but also disenchanted with the political social status quo. How do you pers persuade them towards light? And then um, how do Jews work against the denial of fascism and Trumpism by government officials and uh, the current political environment? And I'm gonna have to cut you all off in about four minutes, so. Uh, uh, the first question is about patriots such as former General Michael Flynn's Awaken America movement. All right. This is, um, I'll just be very brief. This is the theme of the, the book I'm working on now. Uh, if you see these right-wing movements, whether it's the general, Trump, or anything, as, you know, crazies, you're going to miss it. Because starting in 1945, we have the Tom Brokaw Greatest Generation story. And, you know, those who come back. What he doesn't tell us is there were equal number, well, not equal number, but a very large number of Americans who went to war, not because they uh, opposed Hitler, Mussolini, not because they opposed Nazism and fascism, but they were old boys from the old Confederacy stretching across the Southwest, and they went because Japan bombed us. And when someone bombs you, you punch them back in the face. And when they came back from war, they felt that they had been betrayed by their country. Their country had sold them out. Why? Because Congress had passed all these bills like the FEPC, Federal Employment Protection Act, and suddenly Jews, before we left, we had no trouble in the South because Jews and blacks knew their place. We've come back from war, and our country has betrayed us. We are the true patriots. And I will argue from 1945 until now, these people genuinely believe that they are the patriots, and that I'm going to guess the people in this room are the anti-Americans. Thanks, Anna. I think I just want to close um, with reference to a concept um, that I got from one of our co-panelists who will be hearing about from later today, Chris Viles. Um, it was called the politics of amnesia. Sort of like what happens, you know, at the, with the onset of the Cold War, where all of this history was buried, and where I think today people might say, "Ooh, like, I don't know, anti Antifa, right?" Um, or the idea that that there's something, there's a kind of both sidesism, right? Um, but I think the lesson for the 30s and how to convince, bring people and, and shake an ambivalence is that there is there's something for everyone in this struggle. It doesn't have to be just street fighting. It can be um, calling your, your elected officials. It can be being an educator. It can be talking to your parents at Thanksgiving, right? That, that there is something for everyone and we should think about why these histories were buried, why we don't have them today, why people might have a wariness of, or sort of think, oh, it was all communist front stuff, and that's it. It's, it's so much bigger than that. Um, so to sort of bring people back into that big tent fold. Thank you, Jeff, last, at, last word. At the end of the day, do not be fearful, because ultimately, unlike the 1930s, most Americans still believe in democracy and still believe in uh, the contributions Jews can make to this country and fight for what is right, but don't be afraid to speak out. I don't know if most Americans believe in democracy. How do you support Donald Trump when you believe in democracy? I am sorry, there is no two sides here. I'm not suggesting there are two sides. I'm suggesting that at the end of the day, most Americans are not anti-Semitic. Um. I was advised at, at the beginning, uh, before when we were organizing this, that we should encourage uh, cross-dialogue between our participants, so it's not just, <laughs> and it looks like uh, with exactly one minute to go, uh, we, we began the conversation, which I know is going gonna, is gonna to continue for all of us. So I'd like to first thank our three panelists for your time and expertise. And thank the Center for Jewish History for hosting us, and also uh, to let folks who are here now that we have a 15-minute break until our next panel. Thanks so much. <laughs>